before we jump into the cartoons and how service members utilize them during the conflicts, I want to tell you a little about myself. I graduated from Pacific University with a double bachelor's in history and sociology. After taking a year off, I got accepted to Hawaii Pacific University into their military and diplomatic studies program. During one of my classes on aviation and air power, I had no idea what to write my final paper on. So after talking to the professor, I wanted to do something on culture. And he said, why don't you look at the artwork that surrounds plants? I took that as, let's look at artwork and plants. So I Googled it, and those artwork came up. So eight years later, my second book is coming out in May. And it went from a class paper of 10 pages to my master's thesis and the book. While at Hawaii Pacific University, I worked for the Joint POW MIA Accounting Command on Hickam Air Force Base. And I was a historian there. And what we did was we repatriated and identified missing and killed service members from all the conflicts from World War I through Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, the newest or the most recent one was Spiker from the Gulf War. <clears throat> also, I was the family readiness leader for my husband's family readiness group when he deployed to Iraq with the 209th Aviation Group out of the Army Air Force. So uh, that's my story. <laughs> um, just as a cautionary tale, there is one image in here that people may find unsuitable. It's not, it's not graphic, it's not. A, it's just a painting, but I just wanted to warn you all. It is very important to the story, so that's why I included it. So for this, there are four different types of cartoons. Political cartoons, propaganda, comics, and cartoons. We'll describe and go into each one as we go through the presentation. Political cartoons have been around since the 1800s. And what political cartoons are is a way for individuals to put into newspapers and magazines how they feel in the form of comics. This image was created by Dr. Seuss. Yes, the hop on pop. <laughs> Dr. Seuss shows that political cartoons don't only poke fun at politicians as many people thought. Sometimes they're used as propaganda. This image was created during a time when thousands of Japanese Americans were being interred in the United States because they thought that they were spies. Dr. Seuss was very anti-Japanese. He had very strong sentiments on who should be allowed to live in the United States. This particular image was just one of a collection of anti-Japanese political cartoons that he created. Following the Korean War, Dr. Seuss actually traveled to Japan and while there, wrote Horton Hears a Who because of how he felt his life was changed by actually going to Japan and meeting the people that he had been so against earlier. <clears throat> Propaganda was usually in the form of posters or movies or speeches. And what propaganda was, was a message that really tore at the people. Especially during World War I, propaganda was used to get people to ration, have people buy war bonds, have people hate the enemy, and they did this by pictures. This piece of propaganda was due to the Japanese living and having bases in Alaska. 
they believed that Alaska was going to be the final frontier for the Japanese and that they would never get onto the continental United States. So that's why they said it's the death trap for the Jap. Also, if you notice, the Japanese are a rat. This was very popular during World War II to depict an enemy as a rat or a monkey or somehow make them an animal and therefore not worthy of the same belief that you would treat another human being. <clears throat> the Roadrunner is running towards the da Japanese with the saying, got no time for yips or yaps, on my way to lick the Japs. This image was not only used a lovable character that people could connect to, but also declared to all those who saw this plane that they were going to single-handedly win the war. The Japanese were not the only enemies that were considered rats. Here is Adolf Hitler on the side of a B-17 being depicted as a rat. In fact, the plane's name is the Eradicator. This B-17 was going to be hit, get Hitler and be his final demise. This was not the only plane that had anti-Hitler imagery, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Comics. Comics are comic books and comic strips that are found in newspapers and magazines. It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's Superman. In June 1938, the world was introduced to Superman in Action Comics number one. Action Comics was the first true comic book and was very popular among children and young adults. With most service members being <coughs> young adults, it's no surprise that they immediately connected with this character. As you can see from the World War II B-17, also known as the Flying Fortress, it did not take long for the service members to become interested. Superman comics did not end with action comics. In fact, it has spawned over 10 different sidelines, merchandise, TV shows, movies. It has become a force that continues today. This time, Superman is coming to rescue everyone on a B-24 during World War II. Whether it was young men, the planes, and nose art, there was going to be superheroes. Here is Superman 2 named after original World War II Superman, protecting the world from the side of a KC-135 that was deployed to the Saudi Arabia during Operation Desert Storm. When you think bats, you automatically think Batman. But bats have been on the side of planes since World War I. For the 185th Night Pursuit Squadron, they were saw bats as protectors. They painted all of their Sopwith camels with bats to assist with not only their nighttime flying, but also to be nimble and quick. A lot of people, a lot of pilots and crew believe that what you painted on your plane was your plane. So if your plane want, if you wanted your plane to be fast, you painted something fast on it. They believe that your entire plane was a part of you and therefore the painting was a part of you. The first bat to be used as official insignia was by the United States Navy Observation Squadron which was placed into service circa 1923. This unit was originally outfitted with the Corsair which was believed to be not blind as bats at night. It was the introduction of Batman that really set up Bats for a future. Batman was first introduced in Detective Comics number one in 1939, so right after Superman came out. Even though Batman was a superhero, he wasn't Superman and didn't see as much plane time as, uh, as Superman did. Come to think of it, there are many images of bats 
So did Batman introduce bats on planes, or did the bats on the planes actually influence the creator of Batman? The spider jet with the recognizable black bat on yellow background saw over 45 missions in Desert Storm and was crew chiefed by Tech Sergeant Kevin Patnoid. He said that the reason why he asked for Batman to be on the side of the plane was because he grew up reading Batman and he felt that he had a connection with him. Comic books are not the only comics that service members were able to get their hands on. Comic strips, such as Little Abner, both fought during World War II. This P-47 of Little Abner flew by the Americans, while this Lancaster was part of the Royal Canadian Air Force. Nose art is not only an American phenomenon. Every country, including Germany, and Japan and Italy had no Zarko. So a little about Little Abner and why he was so popular. Little Abner debuted in August 13, 1935, four, and ran for 43 years. Many service members were able to connect with him because he was 19, he was a Southern boy, he was naive, sweet-natured and had girl problems <laughs> so they could relate to him but not only that but the creator Al Cap really took it a step further by making this a cartoon strip that injected political and social commentary into the strip and it was one of the first comic strips to do that Yes, Snoopy on the front of the plane. This is not the only one. In fact, Snoopy is one of the most recognizable images as nose artwork when talking about cartoons. But do you know why? During World War I, Germany had a fighting ace by the name of Manfred von Richthofen. He was the leader of the Luftwaffe 11, otherwise known as the Flying Circus. And it was called the Flying Circus because Richthofen painted his entire plane red. Being that he was a ace and having a red plane, they called him the Red Baron. So when Charles Scholes, Snoopy and Peanuts creator, decided that he needed an enemy for Snoopy, he decided on the Red Baron, a very recognizable individual and a perfect adversary for a little Snoopy to be flying his doghouse towards. Because of their respect for Charles, this Snoopy from Vietnam was actually given, the crew was actually given permission by Charles to paint. And Snoopy was an official military insignia for a fighter squadron after they asked Charles. To the delight of men everywhere, Hugh Hefner in December of 1953 published the first issue of Playboy, a gentleman's magazine that highlighted Marilyn Monroe on the front cover. Initially worried about the how well the audience was going to take to this gentleman's magazine. He did not anticipate a second, but he sold over 50,000 copies and a second happened. The highly recognized rabbit with a bow tie was actually not the official logo until the third issue. But now, by then, during Vietnam, the rabbit was seen everywhere. It was a very popular logo not only because they could get the magazine, but it was a rabbit. And Hugh really picked the rabbit because he felt that it was not only a sexualized connotation, but also the image was playful and fun. This Vietnam Huey shows the little rabbit leading the charge. Another element of Playboy was the inclusion of cartoons. 
one well-known cartoon character, Little Miss Annie Fanny, a buxom blonde who was getting into trouble in most of the cartoons, was first introduced in October of 1962. Nose art and the bunny went side by side until the 1990s. This is actually the official insignia of the VX4 Evaluators, a test pilot squadron that would test pilot jets before they went to combat. Essentially, all cartoons can be traced back to one man. In 1901, a young man was born in Illinois. By 1911, his family had moved to Kansas City, Missouri, and soon after that, he dropped out of high school to join the military. Being only 16, the military rejected him. So what did he do? He joined the Red Cross and was soon shipped to France to be an ambulance driver. While working in France, during slow times, he would draw. After a year commitment, he returned home and with his brother, saved up enough money to move to Hollywood. In 1925, his first character was stolen, but he persevered and created a second character, one that no one would ever forget. <laughs> Mickey Mouse, here in his first appearance in Steamboat Willie, was not the last. In fact, what started as one little mouse has become a large conglomerate of cartoon characters. Here's Mickey as a traitor. In fact, the first Mickey to ever be displayed on the side of a plane was during the Spanish Civil War. He is on a condor flown by the Luftwaffe, a, directly against the United States. Mickey, probably not minding since he was on the side of the plane, was not the only character to get airtime. Looney Tunes, a direct competitor of Walt Disney during the time, and created by Warner Brothers. Interestingly, the name Looney Tunes, sister series, Merry Melodies, was named after Disney's Silly Symphonies. One main character of Looney Tunes was Elmer Fudd, a hunter who could not quite track down that rabbit, no matter how hard he tried. On this B-24, the upper one, meet around the corner, Elmer Fudd is the victorious hunter with a shotgun and his kill for the day, a strip of bacon. However, that was not the original picture. And this goes to show, this is how the troops felt. But the United States military afraid that if this plane was brought down, they would immediately kill the crew. So, the United States military stepped in for the first time and told them, you need to change it. The original image by the 485th was still meat around the corner, but instead of bacon, it was Hitler's head. Right after World War II started, a young deer by the name of Bambi hit the big screen. Jack Dundas, a Canadian pilot who flew the Halifax B, decided that he wanted a catchy picture. And with it being the Halifax B, he wanted his plane named with a B. So, thinking that it would be really cute to have a little tiny deer on this massive Halifax B plane, he chose Bambi. This actually, Bambi, interestingly enough, is the first plane of the 424th to successfully bring her entire crew home safe for the entire tour that they were over there. Bambi had a friend. They all do. 
While Bambi was fighting the Germans in Europe, this rabbit, who liked to make a mess of things, was over in the Pacific Theater. Thumper, on a B-29, did a lot of thumping and has the bombs to show for it. Ah, uh, Mickey. This time with Betty Boop, flew on the side of a German Mischerschmidt. The Germans realized that nose artwork by this time was actually a morale booster and lessened their regulations on what could and could not be painted. In 1948, the movie Command Decision starring Clark Gable was released. This movie depicting B-17s over Nazi Germany resonated with troops on this Korean era B-29. During the Korean War, there was believed to have been miscommunications and some troops felt that they were not getting the information or the direction they needed. This artwork summed up how some felt and the crew aptly used two of the seven dwarfs from Snow White to really bring the idea home, that no one really had an idea what was going on. Batman's arch nemesis, the Joker, really took over during Vietnam and had the perfect match for the Huey, who you can tell has a perfect nose for art. Pilots and their small crew took every advantage of the nose and really took painting to another level. This pilot not only liked Joker, but also liked Rosemary's Baby, which was a psychological cult movie. The second little picture is a little creepy, a little less creepy in my eyes. The Pink Panther, a movie that was originally released in 1963, follows a bumbling French detective as he tries to solve crimes. Debuting in May 1984, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was a group of four turtles who were nuclearly who were exposed to nuclear radiation and therefore became Ninja Turtles. This plane saw action in the first Gulf War. Here's another plane that fought in Operation Desert Storm. Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, sporting his radioactive outfit, is causing mischief the only way he knows how. The only thing missing is his stuffed tiger paws. One of the longest cartoons currently airing is The Simpsons, which is going on an unprecedented 26 seasons. That rivals almost every cartoon figure that we have talked about, with the exception of Batman and Superman. From humorous to downright political, the Simpsons have never strayed away from speaking what's on their minds. This image, another plane that flew in Operation Desert Storm, assisted the armored forces of the Seventh Corps during one of the most decisive battles of the Gulf War, the Battle of 73 Easting. Bart here is saying, Tawakana, dude, followed by a bomb blast. Bart is also standing on a bomb that says anti tape the Tawakana Division was an Iraqi Republican Guard unit that was equipped with tanks, among with other armored battle maps. This was the battle that changed the tide in Operation Desert Storm. Most of the imagery we've talked about is powerful and masculine. For those of the audience who don't know who this is, this is My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. They're little ponies that are friends and run around. I have an eight year old, I see it all the time. <laughs> this image was actually sent to me by a friend who is currently stationed over in Afghanistan. She saw this and thought of me. So this little pony is somewhere fighting. <laughs> So what does the future hold for nose art? As long as we have planes in the air in 
an offensive or defensive position, there will be no Zard. The, this Oregon National Guard jet is one of the entire squadron that played homage to Oregon. This one is Portland with the skyline of Mount Hood and a rose. There's also Pendleton, Ashland, Eugene, <coughs> Seaside. I would like to thank you all for attending my presentation. I will open the floor to questions. And I have another presentation at one talking about how culture has affected NOZARP.